Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Shakar Amar, an innocent man, spent 14 years in illegal detention and endured around 200 sessions of enhanced interrogation, much of it qualifying as torture. He was a British resident with a British wife, four British children, and he was entitled to British consular protection. But the British officials who witnessed his ordeal early in their captivity included John from the British intelligence. There, not to look out for him, but to John, but rather the identity of the elected politicians who sent him there and must have received his reports. Well, Shakar Amar would still be in Guantanamo Bay if it had not been for the magnificent campaign fought on his behalf, as he himself said in this interview. How can you give up? All these people, they're going every, you know, Joy, Harkom, Juwan, Andy, and all these safe Shakir, stand with Shakir. Truly, I couldn't believe it. I cried one day because Juwan, they asked Juwan, he said, Juwan, you know, when are you going to stop doing what you are doing? And I read the article and I cried because she said, I will never stop until that man comes out. And I'm glad to say that we are joined today by the aforementioned Joanne McInnes and Andy Worthington. Welcome back on board the Sputnik. And the first thing that must be said is congratulations. It was a magnificent campaign, fought with verve and with imagination, giant inflatables, <laughs> major <laughs> rock stars. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, able to enlist such important political figures as, uh, as the Right Honourable David Davis, mm -hmm. Andrew Mitchell from the Conservative side, and uh, the then little-known Labour backbencher, Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> uh, uh, who knew? John McDonnell as well. John, yeah. John McDonnell yeah. set up the All Party, uh, Party Parliamentary Group. Okay, and he's so a who really knew, important player. Uh, how successful this campaign would be all round. Um, first of all, tell us, how is Shakarama? He's He's good. I think, you know, after all this media, he's like hankering after, you know, a quiet life. Just uh, this media, uh, you know, came quite quickly after his release. What is it? Six weeks. And uh, I think there's a normal trajectory of coming out and being all, you know, very excited and having a little bit of a dip. And he's not all that happy about being recognized on the street. He said it's not like being a celebrity where they're necessarily going to look at you admiringly. He's worried that people will look at him suspiciously. But so far, he has seen people, you know, people have been really, really positive um, about, you know, who have recognized him. Now, of course, uh, the backlash has begun <clears throat> from those who, whose role in life is to justify Guantanamo Bay and the so-called war on terror. I myself had a taste of it on the BBC this uh, last couple of weeks uh, in which I was confronted by a former British Army commander in Afghanistan openly repeating the canard that uh, Shakar Amar was a trained, militarized Al-Qaeda operative. And the fact that there is no evidence to support that at all didn't seem to trouble them. Um, is that unsettling for Shakar? Uh, I don't think he's very bothered about it. I mean, he knew it was coming. He knew there would be such people saying such things. But uh, I think he's confident that he'll, you know, his message, you know, will will triumph, and that he has an answer for every one of those allegations. That's the main um, thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. he he knows they're not true. Um, I, and and I th and I think when we see good coverage, what we get is I know when the first photos were taken of Shaka, a bunch of paparazzi. Um, photographed him in the street many weeks ago. And uh, the Telegraph's report, I thought, was very fair. They said, look, he was accused of all these kind of things, but then all these charges were dropped in 2007 when he was approved for release, which is a very good way of putting it. Because there is a file that exists that is stuffed full of lies. Um, but anyone who spends any time examining the files produced on the Guantanamo prison, not just Shaka, I mean, the majority of the men held there, will realize that these lies are... Many of them are made by a handful of the same prisoners. Um, some of the men who were held and tortured in the black sites, whose, whose testimony is obviously unreliable. But as a number of prisoners within Guantanamo 
who, who we know from statements made by the U.S. authorities, parts of the apparatus of the U.S. administration, have been identified over the years as people who made claims that looked reliable but then were found not to be. And in Shaka's case, these allegations about, about him being involved with al-Qaeda and having met Osama bin Laden come from these particular people. So one of them is Abu Zubaydah, the, the, the man who the U.S. torture program was invented for, who the U.S. thought was a significant figure in al-Qaeda when he wasn't at all. Um, and he's all over the Guantanamo files making, making improbable sounding allegations against people which turn out to be untrue. Um, some of the allegations against Shaka come from a, a, um, a Yemeni prisoner who is, who is well known for having lied about at least 130 of the men held. So he, was, he said that they were doing things, that they were in places that they couldn't possibly have been. That's been well established. So all of these people who claim that there is a shred of truth to the evidence are really, you know, deliberately blinding themselves to mm. the of this has been exposed as lies over the years. Now, there's a very fascinating RT angle in this story. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, um, uh, we met Shaker pretty quickly after he came out um, with uh, a number of other campaigners from the Save Shaker campaign as well and, uh, and some MPs. And uh, he said, you have to use RT. He said, because RT is what the brothers in, in the prison watch. We were, really? I mean, we had sort of heard that. And uh, when we asked him for an explation as to why they were watching RT, I thought it was because, you know, the guards were too stupid to know. Because we it. It. <laughs> it was standard for Russian Just television. Just to watch Max, yeah, and, to watch. Max and Stacey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to get up on the, you know, financial advice. No, they, um, they, because they don't want to point the satellite to the U.S., because they don't want them um, watching, you know, U.S. news and getting U.S. channels. So they point it to Central America, where they pick up RT. And RT is one of the few uh, programs in English, English that they see. You know, and so you're they, watching, guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so now, look, tell, tell me, what happens uh, next? Um, he's very generously, I should say, said that he doesn't want prosecutions of people in Britain. What does he want in terms of accountability? And how can it be achieved? We'll help him to pursue that through the all-party parliamentary group, um, of which um, Dominic Grieve has been, you know, a member, and uh, lots of uh, prominent conservatives, uh, as well people from all the parties. Even Alex Salmon is on that group, and we'll be now pursuing, you know, whether we're going to push for a judge-led inquiry or an ISC inquiry. Different people have different views about what will be more effective, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive, are they? So. Well, this uh, Intelligence and Security okay. Committee is, of course, a hand-picked group of trustees. Uh, and if they're trusted by the establishment, in my experience, they oughtn't to be trusted by the rest of us. Uh, but that said, Dominic is very much uh, on Chaka's side, you know, or has been. Yes, yeah. but there are raison d'etat for, uh, for protection of uh, the politicians and the other officials of the state uh, who are implicated in all of this. Mm. One can see Jack Straw, for example, who ought to be uh, in a public pillory somewhere, uh, measuring himself up for mm. the ermine robe for the inevitable ascent into the House of Lords. Tony Blair may or may not face uh, some kind of justice in the forthcoming uh, Chilcot inquiry. Mm. I suppose what I'm saying is I'd go for the judge-led inquiry if I were you. Yeah. Well, I think, that's, I think that is, you know, what, what, what people really want is something that we can guarantee is going to be objective. And, I mean, they, they won't want that because they, they're not going to want the truth to come out, which is the problem that I could see that with Dominic Grieve and with, you know, with his role uh, in the ISC that he would want to expose the truth. But... I could see that maybe that would happen as the process of the investigation, and then the results of it would be hidden from us. Uh, so, you know, that, what's the mm. point of that? And you get some private justice for yeah. Shaka, mm. uh, well, you know, whereas we need, what we need is public Well, we, uh, need, we need something public, and yeah. I think, you know, I think the, the, what, what people in this country need to look at is what happened in the United States, where there are sufficient checks and balances in place that the Senate Intelligence Committee managed to conduct a four-year investigation into, into the CIA's torture program, managed to, 
to get a redacted version, but a version of the executive summary of that report, publicly released a year ago, which has you know, an extraordinary amount of information about the terrible, terrible things that were done uh, by the United States government and representatives of it. And yet we haven't had anything like that no, we in have, this country. No, we have no constitution. We have no Bill of Rights. I've got to tell you with some sadness, uh, after a long life in British politics, the last remaining institution that I would trust in the country are the judges. And when I started out in politics, I regarded them with opprobrium. Mm -hmm. But one by one, the parliament, the press, the police, the, the broadcast media, each one of them has been revealed to be husks of what they claim to be. <laughs> and so the last remaining relatively uncorrupted institution mm, mm. in Britain, in my opinion, is the bench. Well, look, a fantastic campaign you led. Uh, what's going to happen to the very gratifying one what's going well. to happen? What's going to happen to the inflatable? To the inflatable. I'm also going to back garden. <laughs> I think we need a little uh, museum somewhere. <laughs> oh. Am I, we have time for one really nifty story that hasn't come out, and, and, and I think I'm allowed to say. When Shacker left, I said, what did you leave with, and what did you... They gave him a sort of duffel bag with his prison number on it, 239, you know, as though he was always using it as his weekend bag. <laughs> and inside was all sorts of clothes that he'd never worn, a Koran, brand new, all kinds of brand new things. bag oh. and and so we're hoping to exhibit the inflatable with the you know with his things from Guantanamo that, that he was sent home that with. That would definitely be good wouldn't it an exhibit of uh, I'll these come things. I'll to that exhibition. Yeah. And, and, and of course it. Shaka has to stand with his inflatable. Yeah we have to well. get that yeah. picture. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for Thank all you. your work and for coming on the Sputnik. Coming up next we shall overcome Trump and the US presidential race. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. He may or may not be a dumb blonde, but he's definitely a rum blonde. Donald Trump has left no barrel unscraped, no low blow unstruck in his elephantine rampage for the Republican nomination. But is he going to make it? And who might stop him? Who better to ask than Republican political analyst, broadcaster, and all-round American abroad, Charlie Wolf. Charlie, thanks for joining us. Thank you, George. Now, uh, uh, Donald Trump, as we speak, is in a very commanding position, and it seems mm. the more outrageous his talk, the more popular it becomes. What does that tell he's, us? He's sort of like a certain former head of respect that I know, or maybe still possible head of respect party. That I, he's you. <laughs> he's a right-wing version of you, George. And that's why he wore, you know, and, and seriously. I have nothing to comb over. Yeah, OK. Uh, so he's got you at least on one thing. You know? Exactly. He's, yeah, I'm sure he'll be proud. But if, if, if you think of it, both of you are wonderful orators in your own way, and you're not beholden to political speech. You know, if, if you're someone who's a serious politician or one of the bog standard politicians, you know how it, it's done here. You don't say anything because obviously the press or the opposite, uh, opposing side will hold you to it. So you know, we answer a question with the answer to another question. Trump doesn't care. He's not a politician. And granted, his positions can shift from day to day, if not minute to minute, uh, which a minister or, or a regular politician could get away with. But you guys can do that. I and mean, you can be outrageous and do whatever you want to do. And, and that attracts people. But I think in Trump's case, What's made him work so far is he's filling a vacuum, uh, especially since the San Bernardino shootings. Um, Mr. Obama does not appear to lead. You know, with all due respect to the president, uh, I watched that speech from the Oval Office on the Sunday after. You look at even back when, uh, speaking of Syria, uh, the, the famous red lines that Assad happily stuck, not only stuck his foot over, put, you know, played hopscotch with. And we have a man who does not take charge. Well, middle America is scared. We've just had the events in Paris recently. Now we had the, uh, on the home soil, we had this event. And again, the Sunday morning, it was not a speech uh, that was up there with, say, uh, Reagan's challenger speech, you know, when the challenger rocket blew up. Uh, and it was filled with this political speak about guns. And all right, you can have your, your view on guns, which is fair enough. But this had essentially nothing to do with guns. It was an act of terrorism. So 
Trump is filling that 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 uh, that vacuum, and people say he sounds like he's in charge, and that's what we want. And also, yeah, he's fun entertainment. You know, you look at the different debates, the put downs. I I personally, um, I don't know if I he he'd be the guy I'd want to run, because I don't know if he's the guy I'd want to be president or the guy I'd want to necessarily go up against Hillary. But I would love to see a Hillary Trump debate. Just before we leave it, though, I'm wondering why Americans, this great mighty country, the world's mightiest, and fought many a battle mm. also, uh, are so afraid. You have more chance of dying in your bath of drowning than in a yeah. terrorist incident in the United States. 1.15 million people have been shot to death in the United mm. States since 1980. 99% mm. of the shooters or more were not Muslims. No, yeah. They were uh, not terrorists. Yeah, yeah. Um, why are the American people so afraid? Whatever happened to keep calm and carry on? I think that was one of your guys' expressions. <laughs> but uh, yeah, listen, the statistics you bring up. He I'm was sure. half American, Churchill. He had oh, yeah, an that's, American that, mother. That's right. You're very right, uh, Jenny. Yeah. And um, I, I think what's the matter is the difference between shootings that happen that are unfortunate. Actually, crime figures have been going down over the years. Uh, we're paying more attention to it because, unfortunately, we've had more of these what are classed as spree shootings. Uh, and let me say this also, just a, a, a reflection to Muslims. When Trump made that statement, I think his problem is he needs someone to work out a communication strategy, to know how to, you know, it's, it's easy when you're in a bar somewhere, or you're, you're a taxi driver, I'll tell you about them damn Muslims, that's how this is how I'd fix the whole problem, you know, maybe in the back of a cab, fortunately or unfortunately that can happen. Right but when, you, when, yeah, when you're on a mic and you're the president or a candidate, the slightest thing can be taken as symbolically now uh, and, and taken out of hand. Remember, the second clause of that sentence was until the government gets its act together. Works out what's going on. What the hell is going on, yeah. So it sounds to me, and I'm not necessarily defending Trump, but you know, looking at it fairly, it sounds like he was more uh, taking his, uh, his vehemence out on the government, saying, you know, like everybody else, they're stupid, to use a, a, a Trump line. Um, I think if it had been me, I would have phrased it to say the effect of, right now we've had an attack on the homeland. We don't know who we're letting into our country. I know there are many good people that want to come in, and we'd love to have them. But until we know who is coming through the front door, I think people from countries X, Y, and Z, um, I, I want to close the doors to them temporarily until, again, the immigration, State Department, etc., figures out what it's doing, and we know who we're letting in, who we, we want to welcome and to be our friends and to prosper like everybody else has in the United States. If he did it that way... Well, instead, yeah. he used the common denominators of Muslims, yeah. including those Muslim countries. Fighting in the U.S. Yeah. Army. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and where yeah. he's got the Trump hotels all over the Middle East and yeah. other Muslim countries. And oh, I know, I know. It, well, I think one of the problems is, is a way to try and differentiate. Uh, for instance, uh, as you know, Mr. Obama will not say, them. And again, I don't think it's necessarily the Quran that's, that's inspiring them, but when you're talking a, a, a fervent religious belief, that's a pretty strong, you know, these are people that are willing to blow themselves up. You know, in past days of warfare, uh, whoever you were fighting, they wanted to stay alive, you wanted to stay alive. So it's finding that way of acknowledging that yes, in its own way, Islam plays its part, but obviously it's not Muslims. You know, and I, I used to like the term Muslim versus Islamist. To me, and I don't know if that's correct or no, not. But, the other way around. Or, uh, but yeah. to me, it no, is Islamist fair, or something. Uh, you know, it was, it's a fair uh, yeah, extreme. You know. I prefer the word extremist myself. Yeah. Because there are extremist Jews, Christians, mm -hmm. Muslims, Hindus. There yeah. are all kinds of extremists, and we yeah. must be against them all. Oh, yes. But I think the thing that puts this one at the top is remember, these are the people that are calling for a worldwide caliphate. These are the folks that are beheading people, you know, in a most shocking manner. Again, not to take away from the others, you know, as a, as a, a Jewish boy, uh, you know, I was with my friend Bonnie Greer once, we were talking about going down south, and I'm sure there's still some leftover white supremacist Ku Klux Klan people that hate me just as much as they hate Bonnie. Uh, so, I, you know, I understand it's out there, but what's made America nervous is, you know, remember we've had 9-11, which was an event beyond all others, 3,000 people, Jew, Muslim, Christian, were killed. And we have a group, again, 
that is calling out for a worldwide jihad. Sure, and, you, you know, uh, calling out for it, but not actually yeah. able to carry it out. That's why I'm, I'm slightly surprised yeah. at the levels of fear and anxiety. And I'm wondering if the politicians and the media class, for their own reasons, are helping to turn that up, to well, stir I, it I, up. I, don't, I think in some respects it goes back to what I said before about Obama. By, by not recognizing what it was, and again, by, by really not getting invested in it, um, you know, it's been said recently, he seems to have more hatred for Republicans in the press than he does for ISIL and Daesh and what have you. Um, you know, it's a president's job to bring the nation together. And unfortunately, I see him divisively tearing it apart. Mm. Um, and, and that's, what I think, again, is where the problem is. You know, as long as you think of, of these middle Americans as, you know, angry, knuckle-dragging, uh, what was the line um, with their guns and their religion, you know, I think they're, for the most part, honest people. Just like if you want to take, for example, here in London, uh, when Cameron went off against UKIP. And I don't think that all the members of UKIP were members of the, the National Front. I think a lot of them, rightly or wrongly, were good, honest people that are sitting there worried about too many immigrants coming in and affecting their job or their pay. Mm. Now, that may be right or wrong, but I think it's sincerely held beliefs. Is Trump going to do it? it looks at, to me. And if not, who, who's going to stop him? Well, it's interesting. We've, we just had the last debate of this year, of, of 2015, and the first debate since San Bernardino. Uh, and actually, the guy that seems to have come out, the, the sort of dark horse you would have seen coming, I think, is Ted Cruz. Uh, and he's played a very interesting game of being Trump's friend. And not, you know, for instance, George, or not George, uh, Jeb Bush excoriating uh, uh, Trump, uh, you know, with that line, I think he's unhinged. Now, on the day of the, of the comments and all the different media I did, people were saying, well, are you going to condemn them? And I said, well, I'd rather analyze them. And also, we've heard enough. I mean, everybody went without saying. So I would say, watch Cruz. He's played a smart game. He's very conservative, almost a little too conservative for my own liking. But there's a battle now going up between Cruz and Trump, and also Rubio is sort of in there. And I think Christie is up there a little bit. But also remember this, not a vote has been decided or cast anywhere. It hasn't started yet. The start of this election cycle begins, I think it's the end of January, with the Iowa caucus. I, I, it's hard for me sometimes to figure out. I was talking to a good friend in, in uh, New York recently, and, and I said, what do you think? And he said, I, don't, I just don't know. None of us know. It isn't you know, going to what should be expected, to, just as I'm sure with you. You can read what's going on in the country, and you have an idea who you think or th is going to or not going to be the, the next prime minister or the next party in power. He's broken all the rules. Mm. Um, up until now, everything has re revolved around Trump. You know, you watch a Democratic Democratic uh, debate and the, uh, the anchors on the news media going, well, I wonder how Donald Trump is going to affect it. It's like, it has nothing to do with Trump. And it's still, you know, we're having uh, Franks and Beans tonight for dinner. I wonder how that will affect the Trump campaign. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's, it's like, <laughs> you know, he, he, he sucks all, yeah, and, and you know, uh, I guess the downside is he sucks all the air out of the room or all the oxygen mm -hmm. out of the room. After that, uh, uh, that comment he made on, on uh, closing the door to Muslims, Trump in the next week got, I think it was four times as much media hits as all the others put together. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And they're complaining. Children in the street in London know who Donald Trump is. Yeah. Uh, people who live in Ted Cruz's street don't yeah. necessarily <laughs> know who he is. Yep. Charlie Wolf, as always, mm -hmm. words of wisdom. Thanks, Your insight George. is very valuable. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, with the release of Shakar Amar, him, him back in England, would an amnesty be enough to get the truth from Tony Blair and Jack Straw on rendition and torture? Sean Caden says, now that's a very interesting question. God willing, I'm looking forward to seeing them in orange jumpsuits. Well, I think the humiliation of any prisoner, even Jack Straw and Tony Blair, is unwarranted. But uh, undoubtedly, with Chilcot and with our film, The Killings of Tony Absolutely. Blair, I'm closing in, bearing down on these people, the pressure is on them. On Donald Trump, Ricardo Picasso says, Trump is the tip of the iceberg. Election boils down to choose which odious dollar-backed reptile you want. Bernie Sanders, the only alternative. Alas, beginning to fall behind now in the polls. I think you can say Hillary is definitely the Democrat. 
Big Unfortunately, question yes. is who's going to be up against her. Well, that's all that we've got time for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us through Twitter on RT underscore Sputnik and on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>